Ich muss ja sagen, aus persönlicher Erfahrung, dass der Kongress für mich gerade deswegen so schön ist, weil er so äh, traumhaft familienfreundlich ist. Wir sind diesmal wieder mit zwei Kindern da und da ist natürlich das Kids Space absolut Gold wert. Aber, und das glaubt man gar nicht, äh, dieses Ding hier, das Decktelefon, das macht diesen Kongress auch für mich extrem kinderfreundlich, weil wir eben schon vor vielen Jahren unseren Sohn mit so einem Decktelefon einfach laufen lassen konnten und er konnte den... Okay, so the speaker is telling an anecdote about how he's giving his kids a, a decked phone uh, of, from this uh, conference's uh, phone system uh, that enables uh, the son to walk around on his own because he can always call his parents. Uh, and I'm just a user of the system, but the people that are on stage now will tell us what is possible with this technology. We are greeting Civilian and ST, which are parts of the uh, event phone system, and LaForge as a guest hacker will show you this talk that is called Hashtag Me Fail or with Gigaset This Wouldn't Have Happened or the subtitle is Decked is Correct. This talk will be translated by the C3 Lingo team. You can leave feedback for the translation on Twitter at C3 Lingo. Well, thank you. We are very surprised. Uh, we thought this would be a kind of niche translation. We thought this would be like 20 people. Now it's more like 40. Actually, it's probably a couple of hundred. Um, yeah, so we, the presentation is kind of done. So what will we do? Uh, we have to hurry up because it's actually a lot. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the POC. We will talk about uh, the technologies that we are using. And uh, that's uh, why uh, we will show you the hardware live on stage and how it works. So the next thing will be um, the, the problem we're having, um, the, the security um, variation that we found um, and LaForge will describe that in detail and we will tell you about how the the manufacturer uh, handled it and what we built with it and how we use the security variability for more features and um, can do more for our users in fact. Uh, then we will continue with uh, metadata and uh, how we, we actually gained that. And then we will show you live on stage how to um, get unwilling devices to become willing. And then we will show you some plans for the future. So let's start. What even is the POC um, and the event phone? So what does the internet say about this? The internet says the phone operation center is an integrated hard and software project which enables uh, to use phone systems on big events uh, in, uh, in a, on a big area. That's uh, how Wikipedia puts it. And in fact, that is the case. And we also think it's nice that Event Phone is a relevant operator of wireless uh, communication for big events. Uh, this, of course, makes us uh, very happy. And now we'll continue to our one pager. What are we actually doing? We uh, provide infrastructure for wireless uh, phones. Who of you in the hall has a decked phone? It's probably about half. And uh, then we operate uh, phones for rent for organization and infrastructure teams. Uh, we provide them uh, earlier. We, we uh, ensure that they will work and make them operable. And we also disinfect them, of course. Then we have uh, SIP and premium SIP that we operate. Premium SIP actually does have uh, different uh, functions. For example, the, the CERT, um, the, the emergency services here on, on the Congress have more rights and more is more stable connection. Then we operate the EPVPN, which is a phone system that also works outside of the, the events that we integrate with the events, then the, the calling and token handling, uh, which is the, the connection of phones to the system, then the, the guru, which is the generic user registration utility, the, the web portal where one can register numbers and connect devices. 
uh, which is also operated by us and is also the link to the GSM team that whose numbers we operate as well. Then the dial in and dial out, which is the connection to the out uh, outside phone system. Then we op also offer special services, which is the connection to the chaos operation. There are some games, the 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 time and the automatic reception for noise complaints. Also, we have a new uh, section, uh, which is the education about media competence, which is where we show all of you uh, how to look at everything critically and don't uh, take everything for granted and for, for the truth what you see on the internet and here. And, and this talk uh, also event phone turned 18 which is the <laughs> the age uh, that is required in Germany for doing all kinds of legal things and uh, I have to say something about this. There is one person that actually is doing this since 18 years and has participated in on every event, uh, not just the congresses, also every summer, who always was there, no matter if he was sick, he always uh, w was engaged in the phone system, and that's Sasha. And we want to say a special thanks to, for 18 years of event phone for you. So, okay, that's it. Uh, to, to say it for short, we are always reachable, even in the bathroom. If you don't know that campaign, you can see it uh, beyond the QR code. So, what's this, is this talk not about? Uh, on, at the 35th C3, uh, we talked a lot about how Event Phone uh, came to be and uh, how it actually works and some stories. That's not what we will talk about at, at the Easter Hag. We um, explained the new phone system in detail and why we switched from the old Alcatel system to the new Metel system. Uh, what was part of that? Um, that's also not what this is about. You can see those on the internet. Today, we are only talking about this red line, the connection between the Open Mobility Manager, the OMM, and the RFPs, the radio fixed parts, which is the, the antennas, basically. Then, the, the tech boys will use a lot of abbreviation. And to explain those quickly, OMM, uh, as we saw, is the... Uh, on the earlier slide is the Open Mobility Manager, that's the piece of software from Metel. Then RFP, that's the radio fixed parts, the, the antenna base stations. Then the PP, which is the portable, that's a, a decked lingo, uh, it's everything that's mobile. The Everything that can move, the PPs, is portable parts, uh, which is normal decked entities, but also for example, the small headsets. Uh, if you, yeah, okay, now you know what you, what I mean with those. Then the one abbreviation is the EPI. Um, you are probably uh, know a little bit more about networks. The International Portable Equipment Identifier. You can imagine it's kind of similar to a MAC address. Uh, at, for the example, you can see a part of it is written in cursive, and uh, that's the the manufacturer part, which uh, just like in the MAC address, it's um, hard coded. Uh, you can see what manufacturer produced the device and then there's just a counter after that. Um, also similar to a uh, network is the EPUI, which is the International Portable User Identity, which is kind of similar to an IP address. It's assigned by a system, uh, by the system that operates the phones at the moment. For example, the DHCP server on the NOC um, is uh, the one that uh, hands those out. And the, then there's the European Ter Telecommunication Standards Institute, the ETSI, which um, basically creates the standards for Europe and especially DECT. The EPUI, um, as an example, uh, it has different formats. It doesn't have to look like this exact uh, example. It's not that n as normed as it is for the IP system. And now let's have a look at SIP. SIP decked on Mitel. So civilian will talk about that, and he'll watch it by the camera. All right. Um, 
How to is the title, so we've been asked a lot how we're doing it. Can I help with that at all? So what do I need to do for it at all? Naturally, you'll need an antenna radio fixed pad. There are different generations of that. We're showing, we're recommending generation 3 plus. They're easy to identify because, for example, they have ventilation on the back and there's also a USB connector. So if you want to buy something like that and don't know, unsure about it, we are recommending generation 3 plus. You can get them at the manufacturer, for example, but they're able to get, you're able to get them used as well. It's about 100 euros. Additionally, you'll need a license. That's not an open source software by Mitel. It's a commercial product with a special thing about it. So for small deck installations, you don't need a license, but you're limited to five licenses, to five antennas. If you want to call, not just between deck devices, but also to a SIP or with dial in or dial out, you also need a SIP server. We always recommend Yate, which we use ourselves. In the slides, we also have the cookbook by Yate. You can also find it using the QR code. That's a little how-to if you have no experience at all about it. And using that, you can install it yourself pretty easily. There are two possibilities of using the... You can either run it on the antenna using Linux, but we never tried that, so we don't have any experience about that. Alternatively, you can use anything running Century. For example, for example, the one that we run here at the Congress, there is uh, a little VM and uh, a little server in the NOC that has a VM on it with CentOS. So if you have the antenna running, then um, the first one is connected to the other ones via IP, and the other ones then need the connection to the gate. So the, the downside to this uh, setup is you can at most run to 512 uh, end devices on this setup. And if you look at the dashboards, you can see that we are vast beyond that. So there is a hard limit on top, so you need to extend it a little bit. If you do it standalone, then you can then you have a lot more radio antennas. So you can have a lot more end devices. This supports up to 5,000 devices. So we already no mentioned it a few times. And the question is, how do you get it? The official answer of MITEL is that if you get a device, then you get the uh, relevant credentials and you can download it in their portal and just download it. So if you get the antenna from the second-hand market, then you obviously don't get the credentials and you don't have the download links. But it's the release notes are public for the most part. And if you have the right search terminologies, then you can find them easily. So this is why we put them on the slide. You can just use these and you can get the credentials. So the question is, what do you do with it now? And what hackers do is they just look at things in depth and go deeper than the others. And this is what my colleague is going to tell you about. Uh, firmware analysis. So for me, it's normal to look at firmware because, yeah, it's kind of obvious for me. Every device I get my hands on, I'm just going to look at. I want to understand how it works. I want to understand what makes it tick. I want to know what it's built off. For me, it's natural to do this. So I just had an antenna and wanted to look at it. And it was 10 years in the past that I've last looked at stacked. We had a tool that was called Detective. We found a vulnerability in it back then. But that was the last time I looked at it. Uh, and Decked, which is a pun on uh, discovered, but also Decked. 
and there is a specification for this and I've been doing the specifications for the last 10 years so and they're all rather interesting it's it's a bit of a taste but a matter of taste but for me it's very interesting and deck is still very common so there's also deck ULE for IOT devices and I heard that since last year or maybe a little longer the POC is very interested in running a new system the Mitel system and last year in November I had to move and the December Congress was too annoying to or take care of hard or too much effort so I sat at home for a while and I looked at those specifications for a while and if you look at it you first start with the hardware in the generation 3 and I looked at the board what kind of uh, pieces are on it and you can find an ARM system on chip and if you look at the firmware then you can see that it's basically a mainline Linux kernel and it has two Ethernet ports so if, if you uh, can't find it it's usually very uh, very often you can find it in uh, network attached devices like Shiva plug it has two of these Ethernet ports in this configuration one is the one that talks to the OM the one that is being let outside it has a port on the outside and there's a second Ethernet port and my question was if it's inside what is what is point of it and the point is that they actually attach the DEC processor over the Ethernet port so they actually have two of them one to the outside one to the DEC port and so it's a Linux and it has a password that you can use for the root user and during the configuration it's being set and you can actually look at it because it's being set by the OM so it's easy to get access to it you can log in and then have a look around so you can see the schema on the bottom it also has a UART here there's also GPIO and so on so now if you look at the user space software that looks interesting Interestingly enough, it's basically really a very clean mainline kernel with a very few patches. So, in the essence, there's nothing really deck specific in the kernel. It's really, really normal, no extra drivers. There's only just one uh, program that's called IPRFP that creates the Ethernet connection to the DECT processor and the whole processing and of the DECT is being done on the processor. So, there's, it's a very mainline, very standard vanilla kernel and there's not a lot you can see from there. So, interesting, however, is you can find some other things which may be interesting. For example, there's a video for Linux in the kernel and I was wondering what's the point of that in a deck base station. Is there a configuration option I haven't found yet? But there's, it's actually what's true is you can attach a video camera to the USB and if you have a phone that actually is video capable, you can actually view the video that you see there. Very interesting function. And then you find, oh wow, there's also Bluetooth. So you can probably also create Bluetooth pictures so maybe to do location services in a museum or something very strange but it makes sense in the end yeah there's actually use cases for these kind of things so you also find binary images for the firmware of the stack processor for example the bootloader which is actually connected to the serial interface between the processor and the out. The firmware is installed via Ethernet, it can install the actual firmware. There's a MacMoney.bin, which is a Mac monitor. I'm not quite sure what it actually does. I didn't look into it further. So, once you look at it, you have this Ethernet device, but what do you need with it? Um, you'll take a look at the decrypt file. Interestingly, there are just raw Ethernet frames. There are different subsystems for the Ethernet types. 
um, differentiates between which system is actually speaking right now. You, you take a look at it with everything you know about DECT. So you're trying one thing or the other with a telephone that's attached to it, and you try to understand it. Then I was using a minimalistic Wireshark thing to check the protocol. And from a specific point where you can find the DAC standardized packets, um, but there's no Wireshark dissector for that either. So I started something about it, but it's just very minimal just to confirm my results when I was doing it. And then you're getting ahead and you don't find any Wireshark dissectors either. So you can see the split of functions on the DECT protocol stack. I won't go into detail, but whoever's interested into that further, I, I had a technical presentation about it at the DOSMO. And you can also find it at media.ccc.de. And this is the split in the OM. There's the DLC layer and the NWK layer and what's above that. And the interface between DLC and MAC layer, there's the protocol you can see with these raw Ethernet frames. So now I have a general idea of what happens. So I'm further looking into the open IFP protocol. You can see there's a TCP connection that's been created. Um, it looks very random, so there's a big entropy, so it needs to be encrypted in a way. In the RFP and OM, we can create a lot of logging, so we can take a look at hack dumps, but it is in no relation to it, it's still encrypted. If you take a look at the symbol table, you see Blowfish. There are some Blowfish functions used by Open, uh, from US OpenSSL. And this is linked with LD Preload. You can link other libraries. So there are two of them. There's one, uh, LibTraceFish, which outputs hypertext and print text, plain text and cipher text. And um, so. You can get the plain text on the other side to correlate the encrypted with the plain text. So many of the raw Ethernet frames that you can see um, are just one to one past. Uh, they are getting encapsulated uh, on the TCP protocol, but uh, that's mostly it. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, some other people looked at that a little closer. What's important about this is that uh, so we can disable this encryption, but so this Dieter Spa that is known from something else, he, he looked at the encryption a little more with, with Blowfish and saw that uh, it's pretty clear that there's one CLI that, that is globally, statically distributed for all devices. And that's, of course, bad. Yeah because uh, when one has one identical global key that can maybe be extracted from that firmware, that would mean that one can uh, decrypt the communication from all the other devices, which uh, brings us to this DDECT protocol. So as LaForge said, it's just one static key that is used for all instances, which is kind of critical because uh, if somebody is capable of uh, carrying out a man-in-the-middle attack, he can read and potentially manipulate all of the data passing in between. And then we thought about well, how could one uh, get to this man-in-the-middle position. So we have a photo here. Uh, there's a, a red circle there for those that you, of you that can't see. And then we zoomed a little closer. This antenna is hanging fairly low, sometimes they're way higher, uh, for example in, in uh, hardware stores, then you might even need a ladder, but uh, these four black points there, those are just Phillips head screws, and then when you screw them open, there's somehow a lot of space in there and a RJ45 plug. Something might be possible there.
So when man doesn't have the motivation to, to Google about it, uh, not, there are also devices that are used indoors, for example in hotels, they are hanging from the, uh, from the ceiling in hotels. The problem there is this photo is from a hotel near Paris, which is so this is not a problem only existing in, in Germany. Uh, a lot of these bases have a, a very wide installation base. They are used in many, many uh, kinds of ways in, in, uh, in uh, domiciles, in, in, on events, and uh, in hotels, and uh, lots of spaces. So this led us to the thought that we can't leave this standing that way. If, if we can hack this, other people can too. And so we learned that, of course, we do this uh, responsible disclosure. We, we tell the manufacturer and give them the possibility to, to solve this. We even got a CVE number for this. So how did the manufacturer respond? We have to make this transparent uh, a short timeline. Uh, first contact tries were in the beginning of October. We, we called the MITRE support because we only found an email address on the website that looked kind of generic. So we dialed ourselves through the telephone menu. We got uh, a, a worker there and talked to them that told them that we wanted to talk about uh, the security on ZipTech. And uh, then they said, ZipTech, I don't know. Uh, I know what that is, but I don't know anything about security. So, as an alternative, we got uh, we we contacted a Mitel partner that we have a good contact to, and uh, we told them that the Case Communication Club uh, should tell them before they hold a talk about this. And then we got an email from the communication manager for wireless, and we had a long talk with them. And then this uh, a meeting happened. Uh, uh, a week before this and we presented to them with uh, the things that we have on this table that there is the, a security problem and where it is in our views and we talked about how to maybe solve this. We explained to them very complicated uh, what event phone is and uh, waited and a month later we asked again and then we got the confirmation that yes they have a solution that they are testing in the lab and there will be an update uh, for Congress so you won't be affected. And then one day later, we uh, met them at their office and talked about their solution. And the solution was, you get a custom firmware that has a different static key. So that's, of course, we didn't like that. So we thought about it a little. Uh, we uh, explained our own solution uh, idea. And we got a, a yes. And they said, yeah, OK, you'll get a proper update, but only in 2021. And so we said, um, OK, so that won't solve our problem, but might be OK. And then on the 20th of December, they said it will be before the, the Congress. The incident response team from Canada apparently uh, looked into this, and apparently the problem is bigger than expected. So since two days, the update is available. It's uh, available at, at the, on the download center of Mitel after you enter the uh, credentials for that. There is also a security advisory on the website. and. We explained to the uh, manufacturer that we want to give them the possibility to to uh, explain things from their view. So we uh, have two uh, two slides from Mitel. Wait, did I turn this off? Wait, there's a hack. Use the keyboard. <laughs> okay. So, from the view of MITEL, the problem only exists when you uh, have a man-in-the-middle position that you can gain, which is apparently hard in uh, company networks. And then here again, uh, an update is available, which can be downloaded, uh, and there is a download link there, which, uh, and then there's another link for the uh, security advisory for those of you that don't understand English. Here it is again in German. And uh, if you have any questions, you should uh, contact Mitel and their technical support. So another thing we have to say in sub-90 days from reporting to Bugfix is for such a big company actually not that bad. We have seen worse things.
Geht wieder? Genau. Am Anfang hatte er SP so in the beginning, ST already talked about RFP proxy, so what is that? That's a, a transparent two-way decryption encryption machine man, machine in the middle proxy. So if you're doing it, then do it correctly. It can decrypt and encrypt several types of communication. It takes care of rekeying in these protocols, um, exchanging the blowfish keys often is able to manipulate selective messages. You can inject messages, you can remove messages, and to guarantee this, the stability, there are different, different, several types of processing. For example, at our event. So to take a look at it, that's the way it looks normally. You have an antenna which has a TCP on port 12,621. In our installation, we also have an RFP proxy on a different port in our installation. So there's a rule for it, which makes it a transparent proxy in between. So if needed, it can get the communication out through a socket. So for example, you can attach Motorola, a, a logging tool which can write in PCAP, which we'll talk about later. You can also do audio. You can process audio with it or control LEDs with it. So to make things clear, these antennas are stupid. S several DEC specific processing of non DEC specific processing is running in ORM. And these antennas are so stupid, in fact, that they don't even know how to turn on their own LEDs. So when you're using this proxy, you still have the problem that there's not the, the speci there's not just the specific specified deck standard, but also manufacturer proprietary protocols, for example, for LEDs. There's been a lot of reverse engineering efforts, and you need a lot of data for that. So, how did we get that data? My colleague Zuckerberg and I always like to say, so where do you get data from unless you steal from the users? We took an honest approach. So if we just go to any event and get some data, um, we might be in danger, so we just did that transparently. Who of you has been on the ESAC? Very few people. So I just explain that quickly. We wrote a blog post that we want to use metadata. We want to log all data with all data about all the devices who are communicating, except the language. If you wanted to use the guru, you needed to confirm that every time. It was not very pleasant, but we wanted everybody to notice, and we really expected a shitstorm for it, for us logging everything with it, so, every, so that anyone would say, don't do it. And, and before we wrote down everything very specifically, we also noted our intent that we wanted to note the data, find mistakes and irregularities since we didn't know at all what we're looking for. So we just created a big amount of data to look through it. Using this tactic, it actually worked, the strategy. So with a zip, you could create a station with falling from zip to zip, which didn't which we didn't use any metadata of. So all the data we collected extra, we, ex we secured them and encrypted them on a secured file system. So very few people had access to it from POC. It was reglemented very harshly, very precisely. We wanted to do it in a way which we would expect if somebody's handling our data. So in the end, we thought about how do we get rid of it. And a, and a big maximum was maximal transparency. 
So maybe somebody saw it on an event. We also had a video about it, but we don't have, we are not able to show it sadly. So there's a screenshot and a QR code if you want to watch it. There's the principle of four eyes. I'm an actual. I made sure that uh, uh, the developers deleted the data responsibly, and we we thought about what we could do about it. And in the end, we we wanted to throw it all away. And right now, we can't even say how much data it was anymore. And I, I believe we handled it responsibly. And I wanted to still thank all of the users at the uh, Easter Hag, and it helped us a lot. It was really informative, and we could actually uh, create new features and because we were able to analyze them against that test data. And the first new feature my colleague is going to show now. Um, I actually, I already mentioned that these um, software can even uh, control their own LEDs. Those four LEDs that are attached to the base stations that can be turned off and on according to different patterns, and it's being controlled by the OMM. And what we realized is that if you uh, make one of them uh, blink red and green. Then, if you the third LED, then it, if you let it uh, blink red and green, then it doesn't just do that, but the fourth one also starts blinking. So there's also functionality that is being controlled via the LED. The fourth LED is usually uh, used for the wireless, but this is not allowed for us to use because that's what uh, domain of the walk, uh, the, the knock. And why is it blinking? Because in the uh, setup deck was a tool that uses Morse code, but we don't use it anymore. Yeah, you can have a look. There's probably a few other blinking LEDs. The only problem is that you can only blink with one hertz, so you need to have a bit of time. Do you want to switch back to the slides, please? Okay, the second interesting feature is the media tone. If you uh, listen to the headset and there's this uh, sound that you hear, this is generated within the antenna. There's a, a specific message dedicated for that that you can, that you says what frequency to use, uh, in which order it is being used. It has up until 256 entries. It can do four frequencies at once, it can do loops. It can, so we were wondering uh, why would we use the boring sounds, so there's a MIDI converter uh, that you can use to generate these dial tones, and it has loop detection, and we want to now demonstrate that. This is not mine. This is mine. Okay. Please dial 45. Can you please mute me now? Ah, oh, it's ringing. Can you hear this? Very nice. Okay, you're too far. Yeah, the radius is, or the, the distance you can use is limited. Please start Tetris. This is a normal telephone connection, as you can hear, and I'm going to type Tetris now. Isn't this missing a tone? <laughs> okay, so it's not working right now. Okay, now you just, just saw the phone from ST. It's a nice Motorola S120X or 1200. And the X is uh, up to the number of phones, uh, headsets in the box. 
Why this one? Because it's the cheapest one that you can find when you search for decked. It's It has colors, which is nice. It, you can have it in turquoise, in uh, pink, in other colors. It's important that it has gap compatible. You can get that. <laughs> this is a feature you can you can not just uh, attain by um, writing it on the box. You actually have to implement it. This is. There are a lot of people over the last events that just got that uh, device that we got and they couldn't register it so this is why we were interested in we don't have a lot of time so we but we still tried it and we could use the proxy to um, get the traffic from this and we tried to debug the connection request so when you attach it to the base station then it sends a message and it gets assigned its identity that this one ends in df and when it's trying to uh, ring then it sends its own identity it sends the epui and it doesn't end in df and the answer to that is uh, the reject and it gets the reason for it so in the etsy standard or in the gap standard it's defined that this is the way the handshake has to work, and it uh, refers to the DAC standard. There is an access res accept standard message, and it has to save it. And it probably does it, but it doesn't send it again. We assume, and it says that the EPUI is up until is is up to sixty um, bits long, I guess, or chars. So this is what we saw as an EPUI U, and it has a sixty-bit portable user number. We color coded it here so you can see it. So the last two bits are uh, the last two chars are the ones that you can that got lost, and some of these are special because they're using the epi they use the serial number for the device and this is still you and the epi has a length of 36 bit this is defined and if you look at it now there are four bits or rather these two zeros that are not being used at lot at least not at the sip deck device and so this was our um, way of making it compatible to to the base station. We basically move the relevant data to the one byte up and if it uh, if it connects then we move it back and then the OM is happy. And that's why this year even these phones work on our station. So at the event we realized that the other way around, sorry. We made sure that it, we, we only, we wanted to make sure that it only affects these devices, so we moved it back around. So we basically whitelisted for every single device that is affected to make sure that we don't break it for other devices. We also informed the manufacturer, of course. So in September, we sent it to them by Twitter, they sent it to China, and then we asked them again, we heard nothing. Maybe something will happen, we don't know. So at the event, we had to realize that this is not the only one that is affected by this problem. So we we uh, amended the, the list of manufacturer prefixes so that, for example, the Belgacom phone has to work, that um, the Siemens device is working. There's about 20 devices or manufacturers that we know of now where it doesn't work. Audiovisual marketing. So with marketing, we don't really have a thing, uh, but maybe they, they uh, are good with their phones. AVM. So uh, last uh, year, we had the same problem with AVM phones, the, the Fritz phones, which is why we always did not recommend them, that they could never show who was calling. They always only showed intern. But um, uh, ever since we can now not just... Uh, uh, Dis uh, deliver messages but also read and modify them we can now actively show who is calling we uh, also have a positive thing to say about the AVM uh, 
phones. Um, we also brought a Fritzbox, and this Fritzbox can't just do TCP, it can also do DTrace, the D is for DECT, and uh, under the given URL, we can find uh, this uh, capture interface for all kinds of Fritzboxes. The and uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, Gigaset phones can actually display the AVM phone book. And this does not work on our uh, system yet, but we hope that we can change it at some point. Okay, uh, uh, look into the future. What will we do with this? What are we doing with this? So, people that are interested in DECT in general, people are, that are interested in the MITEL installation, people that are interested in, in these kinds of things, uh, we hope we aren't the only ones, and we hope that with uh, these kinds of information you can uh, start getting into it. Uh, you can. We hope that the Wireshark detector will be continued to be developed and uh, analyzed more, uh, play with the hardware, play with the software, and um, there's another thing, right? Yeah. And uh, for example, deck without E. Um, there's uh, uh, another thing. There are EC terminals that work with DECT. Um, and our uh, plea for you is that we are still collecting data. And if we are look, we also talked about this at Easter Hack. We are crowdsourcing. Um, if you know what deck to the phone you have and what model it is and you want to tell us, you can enter it into Guru, which would help us a lot actually because we are, uh, we uh, asked the Etsy for the, the EMC list, the equipment manufacturer code table, and uh, so the one that was uh, displayed in cursive earlier, uh, which uh, allows us to see what uh, manufacturer makes this uh, device, and the response was that this table is apparently secret. So it would be great if you um, entered your model numbers, because then we could um, actually find out what manufacturer has uh, made the device. This is all that we want to ask of you, and uh, thank you. And is there another thing? Yeah, maybe... Oh, yeah, there is another thing about the proxy. It has not been... Um, released yet and uh, we'll tell you why we didn't release it so I already explained it in part we um, only very uh, on very short notice got uh, the response that uh, the the, the tool that the, the update was deployed, we w thought it would be uh, irresponsible to release the tool because uh, it was would be very easy to compromise a lot of uh, systems around the world. We do want to release it and we are talking to the manufacturer so you can all use it and play with it. Um, but the current plan is that uh, we uh, do that uh, in the first quarter of next year as soon as the existing installations have the chance to apply the update. Good. This talk was translated by the C3Lingo. You can find us on Twitter at C3Lingo. Please leave feedback for us also under the hashtag C3T. The talk was translated by Moritz, Kaste and Oscar. And we will next translate the questions and answers coming in. Okay, so please uh, go to the microphones one, two and three. And also questions from the internet will be asked. So you said there was first an update from Mito uh, that w was going to do it, and then, then they said there would be a better uh, solution. So what's the new solution, and how is the key being generated? Okay, so the antennas have to be connected to the system at some point, which is called the capture. And so what we are assuming is that this uh, ex takes place in a, a responsible and uh, to be trusted environment, and the, the keys will be exchanged in there for the coming uh, communications. So every decked antenna gets its own key now. Okay, a question from the internet. Did the, the, the people know from the hardware store know that there would be an outside antenna being modified? That could even be photoshopped. I can't really uh, deny that or uh, say it's true. 
<laughs> All right, microphone two, please. Den Tetris Hack, da kann man den nutzen, um zum Beispiel in, also bei den eigenen Extensions dann ein Can we use Tetris in our extensions so we could create a me melody generator by phone? Um, that might actually be difficult because we only have 256 tones, which is, um, and those only actually work on the 2G antennas. The 3G antennas only can do six tones um, because they saved on hardware, which is probably not enough. Okay, um, a question from the internet maybe? Yes, there's one coming in right now. So, where exactly can you remember, can you notice your telephone device number? Okay, so in the Guru system online, the guru3.eventphone.de, if you log in there into your account, you can see um, a, a, a pencil a button there and you can um, enter it there. Um, there, uh, press the, the, the button the pen and then you can edit your handset and then under model you can add a, enter your model number and the manufacturer and you can even give it a name which uh, has the advantage that when you use it the next time you can just reuse it from right there you don't have to re-enter the token at the next event ideally the phone will just work Apparently one of the microphones got turned off, um, so after the, the question from the network came, this is only for people that actually uh, used event phone and entered their phone there, so then the phone number is connected to the account. Um, if anyone on the internet that is not on the CCC Congress, um, they of course can't do this uh, as, an, as a further explanation. That's because um, maybe people are too, too, lame, too lazy to come here. Microphone 3, maybe. If I understood correctly, if uh, for use stations there are no downloads, so how are you going to provide updates for that? I can't answer that. I, we have no idea. So the contact data is in this advisory. Um, this uh, would, of course, be uh, told to the people that need it. Okay, microphone 2. So you took a look at the communication between the antennas and the ohm. Are you, are the, is anyone trying to replace the ohm through their own antennas, for example, on the Congress? Mm, yeah, maybe. It's a, it's a question of time and the number of projects, which is, of course, growing over time. The number of uh, people working on the project is unfortunately not growing. So, yeah, we would like to do that. That would be great. Uh, I'd be the first person to scream yes. But, of course, we would need people to actually um, get involved there. And this might actually be a, a good starting point for later open source development and working with DECT would be if people um, would... Uh, contribute to the Wireshark uh, deck dissector. Um, this is all kind of part of the deck specification. You would have to need the, to read that and maybe understand it anyway because you want to read uh, if you want to work in that open source context and then uh, you can express that in the Wireshark dissector and then we'd have a great baseline uh, to work from. So yeah, we'd love to have that. Uh, yeah, contributions are what we need. Okay, so I can't see any more questions, maybe on the internet. No, any either. That's then it. Uh, thanks for all of the nice discussion uh, from all three of you on stage and everyone from the event phone. Thanks for all of your work. So, as a la for the last time, this talk was translated by the C3Lingo. You can leave feedback for the translation on Twitter at C3Lingo. <laughs>